Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Laura Jagged, and welcome back. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the How to Life podcast, which happens to be episode 90. This has been the month of personal betterment on this show. I didn't plan it, but I like the way it's unfolded. We started off the year talking about goal setting, but how can you set a goal if you feel confused? So the next week we talked about how to get unstuck in life. That was good. We set a goal. We got out of the mud. Now to declutter and focus. So that show was followed up with how to optimize productivity. And what do we need to do to make it all stick? Repetition. And in this episode, we are going to discuss what creates a habit. And it's not random. The process of forming a habit, good or bad, is the same. It's easy to understand why bad habits are so hard to break when you know how they're formed in the first place. This process is also why good habits are hard to create. Today, I'm speaking with psychotherapist Rotem Breyer about the science behind a habit and the ways to build a new one. You can break out of an old pattern and create a new habit that brings positivity to your life. The power is within you. Hi, Rotem. Welcome to the How to Life podcast. Thank you so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. We're going to be talking about habits. Whenever we think of a habit, we think of a bad habit, but everything we do is a habit. We're going to discuss and dissect, but before we do that, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Yeah, so I'm Rotem. I am a psychotherapist. My specialty is EMDR therapy, and which is a maybe a topic for another episode. And one of the things that I found interesting is that in, in graduate school, when I learned to become a psychotherapist, it was a lot of talk about trauma and history therapy and a lot of things, but not a lot about habits. And what I found from my clients is that when clients come to see me, a lot of times they need help with creating new habits and breaking old habits, what we call bad habits, which by the way, in terms of the brain, it, there's no bad or good. It's just habits that we all have. So I really spent a lot of time helping my clients create new ones. What is your definition of a habit? Habits in their most basic form are neurological patterns in the brain. So when we create new habits, we create new pathways in the brain. These are things that are not metaphors, by the way. These are things that we can see with brain scanners. Old habits are always going to be there. When we create new habits, we create new pathways. And what happens is as we create this new pathway, it's not as strong as a neurological pattern that we've been repeating over and over and over again for many years. So we need to strengthen this new pathway. We need repetition in order to create new habits. Now, you had mentioned in the intro that a habit is neither good or bad, and they're created the same way. There is a similar process in creating a habit. What is that process? We call bad habits, bad habits, and good habits, good habits, but the brain doesn't know. In, in terms of the way the brain is processing that information, it's all the same thing. Habits happen to us below the level of awareness or below the level of consciousness. So habits have three main components, a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. And what happens as these three components kind of get into a cycle, trigger, behavior, reward, trigger, behavior, reward, something happens in the brain that creates some kind of a automaticity. So habits are automatic. So we don't think about them and they're being processed in the brain in an area called the basal ganglia. It's not that prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that we use for conscious thinking. It's a very ancient part and that's where habits are stored in the brain. 
Now, a really great resource, a book that I read and reread a few times is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. It's a really, really great book that explains how habits work in the brain. He breaks it down to three parts. So the first part is talking about how to create new habits, break old habits by understanding the cues, the routines or behaviors and the rewards. And the second part talks about companies. So companies understand, they really understand the complexity of habits. So when you think about companies like McDonald's, when you go to every McDonald's in the country, you get the same cues, you get the same triggers. And at some point, you really stop thinking about what you're doing and you're just acting automatically. Think about social media companies. How many times did you go on whatever your favorite social media platform is and just to check something and spend the next hour or two on that platform and that's a direct result of triggers these cues that these companies are using is it the cue or is it the reward that really captures the attention that's a really great question so it's actually both what's interesting is that when most people try to change a behavior or create a new behavior they focus on the, the behavior itself and what we need to focus on is the cues and the reward. So let's say, for example, that I want to start a new exercise routine. Most people focus on the exercise itself, and most people are really good at starting, but not good at sustaining the new habit. There are a lot of really interesting studies about people who stuck with an exercise routine, who were very consistent about it, and what they found is that they focus both on the cues and on the reward. So, for example, if you want to start a new exercise routine, one of the things that you can do is prepare your exercise clothes and shoes in the evening. So when you wake up in the morning, that can be a cue. Now, a cue can be a lot of things, right? So it can be your exercise clothes. It can be the same time every day. Cues can be a lot of things for people who are addicted to alcohol, for example. Driving by a liquor store is a huge trigger. We know that triggers, for example, increase the level of a chemical called dopamine. So we used to think about dopamine as one of the pleasure neurochemicals in the brain and then as we developed more understanding, we started learning that it's directly tied to rewards. So when you anticipate a reward, there is an increase of dopamine in your brain. And dopamine is not increasing as a result of the reward itself. It's increasing as a result of anticipation of the rewards. So let me give you an example. We're going back to McDonald's. Let's say, Laura, you went to McDonald's. So today was the very first time you went to McDonald's. And the second you take a bite, your brain is getting a flush of dopamine. It tastes good. and The reward. <laughs> right, that's a reward. Your brain is teaching itself that this is a behavior that is worth repeating. You like it so much that you start going every day. And after a week, this splash of dopamine is not when you take the bite, but when you're standing in line at the register to order your burger. The anticipation. And, exactly. And it's not conscious. So when you get this splash of dopamine, you start craving it. Now what happens six months later, you drive down the highway, you see that sign, and you're not even thinking about it. It's not conscious. You take the exit, and before you know it, you end up in McDonald's. So whenever you want to change a habit, you need to automate the process. 
So you had started saying with the example of starting a workout program, you have everything ahead of time. So you don't have to think about it. The shoes are there. The clothes are there. Is that right? Exactly. That is exactly right. And we can reshape our habits. We can eliminate the undesired or the bad habits by understanding and changing, making little tweaks in the cues, the triggers, and the rewards. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the reward because, for example, if we want to break a uh, eating habit, when we eat things that taste good, that give this immediate reward, it's really hard to compete when we eat, you know, like a kale lettuce. So what I do with my clients, we sometimes visualize what's the ultimate reward. There are external rewards and internal rewards. So internal rewards are, for example, when, when we exercise, on a regular basis, there's the endorphins. When exercise starts to, to feel good, that's the internal. But when people start the exercise routine, they sometimes have to give themselves external rewards. For example, if a client is trying to lose weight and they're trying to start a new exercise routine, in the beginning phase, I encourage them to do something as that seems counterintuitive. So do your workout and then treat yourself to something that is not necessarily healthy, but you are creating this habit. You're reinforcing the habit. So you're giving yourself an external reward. And at some point when we exercise long enough, we get this positive internal reward. When we start a new habit, we teach our brain so we can do it with some visualization exercise to anticipate the reward. And that's a longer term rewards. It's not that easy. Most people prefer donuts and things like that. So we do some preparation exercises. What are you going to do? What are you going to focus on when you go to work and that lady from the front desk brings her donuts every Tuesday and they're, you know, they're sitting there right in front of you. That's a huge trigger that a lot of times people don't really use conscious thinking when they grab a donut. So what are you going to do? What are you going to look like? What are you going to feel like? And by visualizing it a lot of times, people can create this internal reward in advance. So my final question is, why is it that people will break an undesirable habit, smoking, overeating, drinking even, and then they'll go a long period of time. They sort of have reprogrammed themselves and then quote unquote, fall off the wagon. What happens there? In my experience, what I see most commonly, so I, I work a lot with addictions, people who've been addicted to drugs, alcohol, pornography, food. In most cases, it comes down to something happens that affects them emotionally and that takes them back to this old habit. So we have to remember again, this is where we started, that habits are neurological pathways in the brain. And when we create a new habit, it doesn't mean that the old habit is going away. It's still there and it will still be there. What we need to do is strengthen this new pathway that we created by repetition with the hope that we're not going back to our old pattern. But what I do before I finish working with my clients, so as we get ready for you know, what we call termination of therapy, we have a plan. We, we formulate a plan. What's going to happen when something stressful has happened in your life? Because this is just inevitable, right? It happens to all of us and we need to be ready for that. So let's say a person has a alcohol addiction. What are you going to do when something really, really disturbing happening? This is when most people relapse or fall off the wagon. So they need to create an escape plan. Right. And the more specific this plan is, the better. 
because we tend to go back to our old patterns. But if we have a very specific plan, we know what we're going to do. We're going to follow this plan. We're just about out of time on this, but I want to ask you one question. I want to talk about an emotional experience that may be the catalyst for undesirable habits that may be the trigger. Is that something that you address in your practice? And I know you do EMDR, which we did not define, but I think I'm going to have you back and we're going to talk all about that. Is that something you address as well? Yes. So, so you asked for an example of something that would happen that will kick people off the wagon. For example, loss of a loved one. You know, a lot of people have 20 years of sobriety or 10 years since they stopped smoking and then they lose someone or something really bad happens. And then before they know it, they go back to their old pattern. So there are some ways that we can prepare them. EMDR is one of them. EMDR is really, really amazing approach. It shook everything I knew about therapy and how effective it can be. Can EMDR help with keeping good habits going? Absolutely. So with EMDR, we have very specific ways that we can help people to desensitize these cravings. So they, they're prepared. So once they, the craving is rising, when they are facing a trigger, they know exactly what to do. That is a great cliffhanger. We'll come back and we'll do another interview all about EMDR. Thanks for talking about habits and formation and breaking today. It was awesome. How can people find you? Uh, the best way, if they can just Google the art and science of EMDR, uh, that, that's my website. Um, I'm, it's mostly for EMDR clinicians who, you know, looking for to learn more about EMDR, provide, provide consultations to EMDR clinicians. But uh, if people want to contact me, there's a contact um, page there. So that's where people can find me, the art and science of EMDR. Thank you very much, Rotem Breyer, for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be able to share information and knowledge to help you be the best you can be in your journey through life. Make sure you check out the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg to learn more about how to break your old pattern and build a new habit. The link for this book and the contact information for Rotem Breyer will be in the show notes, howtolife.com slash 090. If you're enjoying this content, please subscribe to the How to Life podcast so that you don't miss an episode. I love talking and teaching about personal development, but I also love teaching some practical adulting skills on my YouTube channel as well that I call Mominars. A Mominar is a seminar given by a mom, and that is me. They're only five minutes long on a specific basic life skill. It's just patient and encouraging instruction that you can watch as many times as you need. All of this content is on my website, howtolife.com. Check it out and then follow the links and subscribe. Thank you so much for supporting me and listening to this show. If you would, please hit the five-star rating button before you sign off. I would really appreciate that. And I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your time today. I am sending you so much love and encouragement. You really aren't far from where you want to be. And it's all in your control. You got this.